In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Chaplain's Report today, we're going to finish up by continuing our series through the book of Daniel. And just to give you a little bit of background in case you didn't happen to see our last Chaplain's Report, King Belshazzar is having a great feast. And in this feast, he commands for the vessels that were in the temple of God that were taken from Jerusalem by his father Nebuchadnezzar when he conquered Jerusalem. He commands those to be brought out so that he and his friends at the dinner feast there can drink and enjoy themselves. And at this point, while they're doing this, they start praising other gods. They start talking about their own pagan gods and they start praising, the Bible says, the gods of gold and iron and wood and all these other material things. Well, it is at this point that they suddenly see handwriting on the wall that a hand not attached to somebody's body, just a hand. I, I kind of picture it kind of like being thing from the Adams family, but probably a lot more mystical than that. But anyway, just this disembodied hand starts writing a message on the wall and they can't figure out what the thing says. They can't figure out how to read it or what it means. And because of this, the king goes to all his magicians and conjurers and none of them can figure it out. So what he at this point does is seeks the counsel of the queen. And the queen tells him about Daniel and how Daniel has been able to interpret dreams and help out his father when he was king. At this point, King Belshazzar offers lots of lavish gifts to the man that can translate it and specifically tells Daniel when Daniel comes before him that if you do this, then I'm going to just heap these gifts on you and, and you're going to be taken care of. And I love Daniel's response to this that we can see in Daniel chapter 5, verses 17 through 20. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Keep your gifts for yourself or give your awards to someone else. However, I will read the inscription to the king and make the interpretation known to him. O king, the Most High God granted sovereignty, grandeur, glory, Majesty to Nebuchadnezzar, your father. In verse 19, because of the grandeur which he bestowed on him, all the peoples, nations, and men of every language feared and trembled before him. Whomever he wished, uh, he wished he killed, and whomever he wished he spared alive, and whomever he wished he elevated, and whomever he wished he humbled. But when his heart was lifted up, and his spirit became so proud that he behaved arrogantly. He was disposed from his royal throne, and his glory was taken away from him. Now, one of the things that's going on here, and remember that Nebuchadnezzar presumably has been brought back to himself at this point. We're not real sure about the chronology. It's possible that this is in that time where Nebuchadnezzar has been disposed and that he's out living with the beast of the field. But I love the way that Daniel starts out this whole speech. He says, keep your gifts, or give them to somebody else. But I'm still going to do the job that you ask me to. So in other words, kind of what Daniel is saying here, I don't need your riches, I don't need your rewards. But because you're the king and you ask me to do this, then I'll happily make the translation for you. You see, Daniel was living in an environment that was not like this. And we've seen that from earlier in the book. The, the Chaldeans and the magicians, they're all constantly at each other's throats. They're vying for superiority. They're vying for wealth and power. And they're trying to one-up each other constantly. And Daniel is just sitting there saying, this is my job. I'm going to do my job regardless of whether I get these lavish gifts or anything special out of it. Why does Daniel take that stance? Well, I think part of it has, uh, because Daniel was not a necessarily materialistic person, and because he set his mind on spiritual things, 
I think that's a big contributing factor and that ought not be discounted. But I think there's another thing at play here. You'll notice in just a few verses what Daniel actually talks about is how Nebuchadnezzar was elevated by God and he had all this power and all this wealth and he was able to kill whoever he wanted to or uh, exalt whoever he wanted to. Nebuchadnezzar had virtually no restrictions on himself when it came to power and money and all of these amazing things that God blessed him with. And Daniel's looking at that and saying, that didn't keep him from being, that didn't make him right with God. That didn't keep him from suffering his terrible fate. And so because of that, I think it acts as a cautionary tale to Daniel to the point to where he's saying, I don't really need the riches. I don't need the title or the prestige or the, the ability, uh, the, the power to do what I want to. I'm just going to do my job. There is such a level of humility and honor in Daniel's character. And the reason that the king, Belshazzar, offered this in the first place is because in his experience, and I'm sure that this was true, that's not how the people that worked under him operated. They were constantly vying for his favor. They were constantly trying to become more wealthy, more powerful, more influential. And because of that, he understands that this is going to be what motivates people to do a good job and motivate people to do their best to serve him. This Daniel person is completely different, though. All he's doing is saying, I don't need any of that. You ask me to do it. I'm your subject. You're my king. I'm going to do my job. Simple as that. And so because of that, I think that there is a level of humility here that guides Daniel and helps him see past all the material blessings and the influence and power that he could have potentially had here. Did Daniel have the ability to interpret? Yeah. Why? Because it came from God. Now, there's nothing wrong with profiting off of your God-given gifts. Every person that has ever made a profit that I'm aware of and uses that to keep them alive are doing so because of the graces of God. But there is something to be said that Daniel doesn't really care about obtaining all this material wealth. At this point, he's already a pretty influential person and a pretty wealthy person. He doesn't really need any more, and he understands that. And so because he has this level of humility and because he has sort of this cautionary tale of what happened to King Nebuchadnezzar, I think that Daniel really has a lot more foresight than the people surrounding him at this point. Because Belshazzar doesn't. In Belshazzar's mind, this is what really motivates people. And what's important here is that before Daniel delivers the message that God wants the king to have, which I believe actually is another reason why Daniel is eager to interpret this message regardless of what he gets out of it, is because he has the good sense to know God wrote this message on the wall for a reason. He wants the king to know what it says, and he put me in this place to translate it. I don't need to be paid or greatly rewarded for doing what God wants me to do. And so because of that, Daniel's perspective is, I'm going to do this regardless. See, what should have happened here is that Belshazzar should have taken the same cue that David did. He should have seen what happened to his father and seen how his pride and arrogance lifted him up and caused him to be driven away from mankind and live like a beast. He should have seen that and thought, huh. Maybe I should try to avoid that. See, that's another thing, too. Sometimes the folly of another person can act as a powerful cautionary tale for us. Sometimes when we see somebody engage in a sin and fall prey to that sin, it should be a strong warning to everybody else because, of course, God is just and he allows for people to make their own decisions. And sometimes he allows them to fall prey to the worldly consequences of those decisions. And that does spring from his own sense of justice, but it also springs from his love. That he wants other people surrounding that person to see, wow, that behavior did not work out well for that person. Maybe I should avoid doing that. And so Nebuchadnezzar's punishment, not only eventually, as we just read in the last chapter, bring him to where his reason returned to him as the Bible states, and that he learned a valuable lesson 
God was also trying to teach other people. He was trying to teach them a lesson by showing in Nebuchadnezzar's life what being separated from God and and relying on your own self and your own abilities really looks like. It devolves you into an animal. And that's essentially what we are without God. And that was a lesson he was trying to teach those around him. It's pretty clear based on this verse, David got, or sorry, Daniel got the message. Daniel understood. Daniel got, oh, that is not something that I want to follow in the footsteps of. That is not something I want to happen to me. Belshazzar clearly doesn't get the message. So when it comes to our own pride and relying on God, we really need to be a lot like Daniel when we see the plight of, of others around us that are caught up in the consequences of their own sin. We need to heed that warning like Daniel. Don't be like Belshazzar, who despite the evidence surrounding you, still doesn't see the value in obeying the one true God. Stay the course, friends. Hey, to make sure you get all the updates, you need to go ahead and subscribe and click that little notification bell down there. That gets you a notification every time I post a new Bible lesson or political commentary. Now, I'm not saying that if you don't subscribe, it's because you hate America and Jesus. But I can't think of any other reason you wouldn't subscribe.